And so here's reflect. Uh, I need to check. Yeah. I was checking the network. By the way, you won't be able to get on that network without a password. So at any rate, um, let's just check this out. Okay, I'm in trouble again. That's working. Well, that's a pretty poor normal code. Maybe I'll use this. At any rate, um, what I want to do today is to focus a little bit on our markdown and also do that within the context. <coughs> do the context within um, using R and creating reproducible documents. The homework you'll be doing will be in our markdown. So, does everyone have an account at this point? Does anyone who does not have any? Have you all contacted CVs where you have departmental accounts? If I tell you, you know, to go in, if I tell you to go into our website, which let's do. Uh, I don't want to do that yet. So if we go into a website, now what I did do, um, I have posted, um, I have posted the lectures, but the two sets of notes I'll be posting later today. Uh, if you want to type along today, you can. Uh, if you use the book or you follow what I'm doing on screen, most of it's fairly short. And so you can sort of type along today. But in, in the future, what I'm going to do, I have notes you can download before class, and then you can bring it in and upload it. So, you know, the question might be, um, the question might be, you know, how, how do you upload it? Well, you can upload it in our studio. But let me show you another way. If you have, if you're in this lab and have a Mac, um, let me blow this up to full screen. If I say go connect the server, you can type in a command like that: afp colon slash slash stack of You don't you don't need a twelve thousand unless you're off campus. But I usually just put it. So if I if I connect using that. It's going to ask you. It's going to ask for you for for your particular um, where you are. In my case, I'm Jay Horner, and so I can go into say courses and go into 512, 520. I'm sorry, 523 in this case. And so I can look at chapter one and. Now, if I were going to send you notes, if I were going to send you notes, um, then then I could simply go in and say, compress this. It forms a zip file, and then I can just send you that one file. So,
So in other words, I'm actually going into the server. Let's see if it does it. I don't know if I've ever done it from the server. Maybe it. Um, and I'll give you chapter two also. So I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is, what I'm gonna do is compress it. Whoops. I know what I did, but I meant to compress it. Let me know when you got it. Did you get it? So you can download it. And now, obviously, um, the main way I'm going to be doing this is to put it on the class schedule where you can just click on it and it downloads the zip file. Now, having said this, I'm going to be updating that file, so I'm going to be adding some code to it and some textual information to it. So if I do that to a particular file in an email, I'll say, I have updated the notes from such and such a date. I'll let you know if I update a particular file, even if you've downloaded it before. Any questions? So. Let's go into our studio now. So to get into our studio, you should just type in our studio and you may have to log in the first time. So let me get rid of um, the stuff from the last class. And I'm going to clear the console, and I'm going to clear the graph. If you are using this mechanism and you've unzipped it, you can just drag it into your account. You can drag the whole, you can either drag the zip file or you can drag the whole folder into your account and it creates a new directory. That's the best way of doing it. Um, you can upload things individually. You can, on this upload thing, you can upload directly this way from within our studio any files you might need. So I'm going to go into courses here, and I'll go into 523 and notes, and I'm going to look, well, I think what I want to do before I do this is I want to look at this file menu a little bit. And in particular, I just wanted to briefly discuss uh, the types of files you'll be using in this class. You're going to be mainly using um, our script files, which are just files with R code in it no markup. And if you go down to our markdown, <coughs> these are the markdown files. Your homework will given, be given to you as an R markdown file, and then you'll have to insert code. You'll have to write interpretations. Now, if you want to get, if you want to uh, create a really beautiful typeset document, then you will do RSweave, and you will be using LaTeX instead of markdown. Now, the reason that I, I don't want I don't want to spend a whole lot of time teaching LaTeX. 
um, in this course. So I'm going to focus on R markdown because R markdown is something you can learn in about a half hour on the outside. So, so if I want an R markdown document, then um, but if I select one, it by default gives you a template. Actually, it gives you it gives you something that says, okay, this is a markdown document. And the other place that you can learn about a markdown document, by the way, I'm going to um, go back to courses a minute, because I've already, I've actually already saved this markdown document here, so I'm going to sort of select it, so, because otherwise it's going to ask me to save it again. So this is the same file. Uh, if you want a quick introduction, if you go to the help file and you go down to markdown quick reference, it gives you a quick reference depending on where you've rearranged these four. And so I just want to briefly go through uh, a markdown document. If you want emphasis, like bold, uh, you should use um, two asterisks or two underscores. If you want italics, you should use one asterisk or one underscore. Around the text that you want italicized or bold. If you have headers, you can have uh, equal signs, um, give you a bold header. Header two will be dashed. Three of these will be header three and four will be header four. <clears throat> so I'm probably going to be changing what I was doing before um, as I sort of update this. But that, that gives you basic headers with different amounts of emphasis. If you have an unordered list, you can just use asterisks. If you have an ordered list, you can use one, two, three. Now, you get these lists, and by the way, what we're going to do is publish to HTML ultimately. There's a way to convert it into a PDF document, and we may talk about that later in the course. <clears throat> so this would be if you were publishing to the web. If you're doing, if you're doing print publication, then you would want to, want to use an RS weave type of document where you have, but that, that involves a more sophisticated knowledge of LaTeX and embedding R in LaTeX. Here we're going to embed R in Markdown, which creates an HTML file. And so, um, so there are various things we can do. Uh, if you want to end a line so it doesn't automatically wrap, because you know web pages wrap, you can just put two or more spaces, and it actually means it ends the line. Um, <clears throat> links. Uh, so if I want a link, I can simply, um, if I want to link, where am I? Um, I can actually put the phrase that I went bolded, or it would turn out to some color. So if you link on it, you actually attach to another web page. And then you simply put where you want to link to here. So this is all you have to do to put a link to another web page. It's very simple. If you have an image, and the image could be on your computer, or it could be another web page, um, you put. Instead of just square brackets, you also put an exclamation point and an alternate text, and then you put the link or the, this is the directory on your own computer where you want the image to go. Um, and the alternate, why do you have the alternate text? Well, <clears throat> uh, there are, there are text-based browsers. And if you were, in, in, if you had a modem, you know the word, we used to actually do it that way. But if you had a modem that's a very slow connection, or if you're in a developing country or something, and you have a very slow con connection, uh, there are, there are text-based browsers which do not show the images, so you don't see all the ads and all that. And so it's much faster, of course. And the volume you're sending over the net is a fraction of what you would send in a typical web page. So what this does is it prints the alternate text. Whatever you put there gets printed instead of the image. So it's polite to do that. So, so anyone browsing your web page um, or the document you've created, that they would see something to indicate that there's a photo there, even though they can't see the photo. And then um, the key, here's, the, here's the key thing with the back ticks. Three back ticks start. Well, there are different reasons you use three back ticks. But if you use three back ticks and then braces you put R, this means what follows until you end with three back ticks is R code. And so here I'm going to do summary of cars of these two variables. I'm going to do summaries of those two. 
Now, suppose I want R code in line. So if I want it in line, I use a single back tick. So this says, this is an R expression. So there were how many cars? Car study? So this actually goes out and counts the number. It, R, it cars is a, what's called a data frame. And so it actually counts the number of rows, which tells you how many cars. And that's what gets inserted here. It's the actual number of cars. Now I should mention, um, this is sort of the basis of reproducible research. Reproducible research means that your text contains not only the data, but it contains the, and the data actually may often come in the form of a package, but it contains both the data and all the functions and all the, everything you do on the data, including the tables you uh, represent. So technically, if you're doing a reproducible document, every number should actually be R code. In other words, everything you do should be R code that allows you to um, reproduce an amount. Here's an example. So you have you have this data set, and you've done this whole. Suppose you, okay, you're a word person. So you've done the whole paper, you've written your paper, you've created all these graphics, and you've put them in the paper, et cetera, et cetera, and you find errors in your data. What happens? You have to redo everything. You have to redo all the analyses. You have to redo all the, you know, every number in the paper may have changed, including tables, including graphs, everything. Reproducible research, you change the numbers, and everything gets redone in one click of the mouse. But that doesn't mean the conclusions didn't change. So you still may have to go in and do a little bit of editing in terms of what the conclusions might be if that change is a big change. So you may have to change some of the textual information relating to your interpretation of the results, but you don't have to go back and change everything. Now, the other reason to do reproducible research is if, and a lot of journals are going to start, in, some do now and some more will in the future, that you should, if you, I submit a paper, then someone should be able to replicate what I've done. They not only should do that, but they should be able to look at alternative models and see if I actually have it done. If I'm a reviewer for a journal, I want to, you know, if I, if I have this Word document, what am I going to do? Type the data in by hand, sort of email them, say, can, if I'm a reviewer, then maybe I can get the data from the editor. And then, but I'm starting from scratch. You know, if I want to try other models to see if the model they in fact use is any good. <clears throat> but if it's reproducible and the data is part of the document <clears throat> and the code, I have all that. So if I want to try some other things, it's rather simple now for me to try some alternative things. Um, so I think increasingly the journals uh, are going to be doing that. There's a lot of bad stuff published. <coughs> and this, this, first of all, it might make people a little more careful about what they say if they know that anyone Check it. So, so you heard about the case with the, what did it have to do? It had to do with the amount of debt. There's some professors in London, and they wrote this paper. It had to do with the amount of deficit and how that affected the economy. And so they sent their, they did it in Excel, which is the last thing I recommend statistics in, but um, so they sent these two PhD students in Amherst and the, the Excel spreadsheet and the conclusion completely changed because they left out certain rows of the spreadsheet in the calculation. It critically turned things sort of the opposite of what they said. Do you remember reading that a few months ago? <clears throat> At any rate, so um, but in general, if you have reproducible research, That would have been caught much sooner. So um, the key is reproducible research is becoming, you know, becoming extremely important. And I mentioned in my, there's a book I mentioned, uh, which you might want to, I think the book is called like reproducible research in R and R Studio, and uh, it's quite good. It, it's there's another book. Uh, called Dynamic Documents Using R and Knitter, I believe. Knit R means what well, you'll see. 
Well, you see this command, knit? Well, underneath of that is a package called knit R. Okay. <clears throat> so if I just want if I just want plain text, let's suppose I have code and I want code, this is my code. You're not going to execute it, you're just going to display the code. Then you simply do three start and stop with three back ticks, but you don't have the R in braces. So it's not executable code, it just presents the code, but pre presents it with a font so that you know it's code. For example, it's monospaced. Inline code, again, if you have the name of a function inside, if you have a function, you want that, and that function is code, so you want it to stand out as different from the surrounding text, then you simply use uh, back ticks on each side of it. And LaTeX equations, um, um, you know, you, if you want some further information, you can go here and learn a little bit about what you might do with LaTeX equations. So, for example, uh, this is the way of doing the fraction of 1 over n. I sum i equals 1 to n of x to i. So that's what this says. I want a fraction of 1 over n. I sum i equals 1 to n of x to i. So this is a subscript, and this actually forms a summation sign. Um, so other, other, um, you know, other types of so there are a few examples here that you can try out. Uh, there's something called math, math ML, which I don't exactly recommend you use because it's very verbose. This is the thing, same thing using math ML. Maybe it's not. But math ML, um, so the main language you'll be using on the web is HTML, right? Okay. And HTML is hypertext markup language. And the current specification is HTML5. And it's a very powerful HTML5. But there are, other, there are various other markup languages for music, you name it. And the one for math is MathML. And MathML is almost always generated by something else, not you. Because if you had to type all this in for a single equation, you'd go wild. Uh, in LaTeX, you can express it much more quickly. So we don't want to do that for a simple expression. That would be not good. Um, so the various ways you can put, typically you have an equation, uh, if you want it in line, so you, if you say the sum of, you know, if I'm saying the sum of x squared and you want it just in a, in a line of text, you just have dollar signs on each side of it and it will do it. If you want the equation, if it's a bigger equation, you want it to be separate, then you use two dollar signs. Or you can use these other notations. Uh, horizontal rules can be asterisks and single dashes. And um, um, you can do simple tables. Uh, you can't do sophisticated tables, but you can do simple tables. And there is an extension to markup, although it's not supported within our studio, called multi ma markdown. I'm sorry, which is called multi markdown, which can do more sophisticated tables. In fact, it's just more sophisticated altogether. Part of the reason of doing markdown there was to be simple. And the reason that I like it in terms of teaching is, if I say you have to do all your homework in LaTeX, then you're going to spend weeks trying to learn LaTeX. And, uh, that's not really what I want. I want you to spend it on statistics and some R, but not, well, R and statistics. But in this course, it's more R, I suppose, than statistics. But um, I don't want you to spend a lot of time learning LaTeX. But you're welcome to do it. I'd recommend you do it if you have time. Um, so markdown is very, very simple to learn. I mean, this is basically it. So a few documents you can you can learn it. Uh, in terms of um, links, you can you can have links within a page. Uh, you can you can have images, and then there are various other special symbols. So if you want an n dash, you have a dash, an n dash, and an m dash. You simply do a single dash, two dashes, or three dashes. So th these are the rules, and um, you know these are the rules. And in, in order to knit it, I simply click here, and it executes it, and you get this. This is the output. And this was a simple example. 
So I did a summary of cars. Cars is a data frame. It's a type of data structure. And it, it, the summary gives you the min, the max, first and 34,000 median and the mean for each of the two variables. And then I plot cars, and there are only two variables here, so it plots, it plots in this case, uh, the first versus the second, first for x, the second for y, and you can see that there's this increasing trend as the speed, um, as the, I'm not sure what the status it is, but as the speed goes up, the distance is greater. So I have a new tab here, so I can go back to my original tab. So this is sort of the basics, and you should practice a little bit. Are there any questions on this? Okay, I'm going to go into to stat to the notes now, and I'm going to go into um, I'm going to go into chapter chapter one, and I'm going to look at I'm going to look here. Now, of course, this is a trivial file. This is a trivial file. So, if I want to run thing, if I do run, it runs it runs it line by line. But the only thing I want to run is actually the R code. So I don't want to run chapter one. I'm going to run the R code. So, uh, but if I want to do the whole document, I simply can do that. And that's well, this document has one one line of R code, and that's the output. One to so in this case, it's rather trivial. But if I wanted to execute it one at a time, I could simply put my cursor here and say run, and notice it just ran that single line. Now this is a trivial example, so uh, this illustrates it. Um, I used, um, I'm probably going to change this. This is a header, header two and a header three. Uh, using that code. Um, and then I have the three backticks with the R saying this is a chunk of R code or a block of R code. And I named it, that's the label. I, I, you can name these chunks of code, and in other chunks of code, you can refer back to those other chunks of code. In fact, you can include other chunks of code within a subsequent chunk. And so, um, so I named this print example uh, is simply the name of it. Now, if you look, if you look back here, uh, the print, the, the, and what's in bold was a level three header, and that simply um, was a header, and then this gives the R code and it gives the output. Now, the output by default is always double hash, so you can easily see what is the input and what is the output. So that's about as simple as a document as you're going to create. It has one line of code. So any questions on that? Now, as time goes on, now I probably, uh, I actually should have changed, well, I didn't save any objects, so um, I'll show you what I probably, sh what I should have done. I'm going to go back to my notes now and go to chapter two. And chapter two, um, what I was doing here, if you look at rlang.rmd, that's everything in chapter two, but I haven't really done editing here to speak of, and that's a pretty long file. In other words, that file has uh, over 800 lines in it. And so I was going to break it up into one. I, I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do here yet, but uh, what I started to do was to break it up so each section had a different file. So section one, section two. Now, some sections don't have any code, or some sections only have a little bit of code. So I haven't quite decided the level of granularity that I want to use for the files. So for now, I'm just going to go into, I'm just going to go into file one. Now, the other thing, um, the other thing I'm going to do, so here's, this is, the, uh, this is section one, I'm sorry. I'm going to actually go in here and set the working directory uh, to that particular chapter. So can anyone tell me why I should set the working directory for this file the same as the location of that file? Can anyone tell me why I want this working directory? In other words, the working directory is in notes chapter two, and the file is in chapter, the file is in the same place. 
So why do I want the working directory the same as where the file is? Why not? Yeah, well, any objects you create, any X objects you create. So I don't know exact. So if I look at the workspace here, um, you know, these, these are the objects that I created. So I'm going to actually get rid of all these. I'm going to actually remove all those objects and start out with a cl clean workspace because you can get your workspace all messed up with objects from other files and so forth. So generally speaking, if I have a directory, and you can think of a directory as sort of a, a working unit, so chapter two is a working unit, and we're going to create objects in chapter two. And in fact, later pieces of code may use, even a separate files may use those same objects. And so if you have two files and you create an object up here and you open up the other thing and I use that same object, then the second file won't know where to find it unless by default it's in the same directory. And so there's a reason why that you may want to make sure that you keep the objects that you create in the same place as the file. So Okay, so let's let's take a look at this. Um, so first of all, I could just knit the whole thing, and this is what it looks like: knitting all the section, all the code from section one. I'm going to change the headers a little. What I'm going to be doing, and I'll give you an update to this to these files. Is I'm probably going to change the way I'm doing the headers, and I'm also going to be putting some comments in. Uh, in other words, I'm mainly I'm not going to reproduce the book, but I'm going to put some comments that I may want to emphasize. So you have the whole book. I'm going to say, okay, this is important. So I will put my own comments in. So it won't be just it won't be just our output. I, as you know, as I have time, I'm going to add some comments on some key things that I think you need to focus on. Um, <clears throat> so again, once once I do this, no, so I ran the whole thing, but in reality. Um, you would run it, if, you, if I would have had an error, I'd want to run it line by line. So, so let me just run this. I'm going to say x equals 10 and uh, y equals x. Now, I did this last time. So what are x and y? Well, those are symbols, but we might think of them as variables that contain, that contain in this case, numeric information. Now, I could have said, I could have said x the sort of um, got to be careful here. Uh, I could have said x gets ten, and there's no difference. In other words, in a way, I prefer the second method, except you have to type two things, less than and hyphen. But that reads x gets ten. It's assigned the value of ten. Saying x equals 10 is more like what other languages use, however. Now, last time I talked to you about, well, what happens if I remove x? So um, let's take a look at the workspace and see sort of what's happening. At this point, we now have x and y in a workspace, and they each have a value of 10. And as I showed you last time, if I say rm, if I remove, rm means remove, and I can remove more than one object at a time. If I remove it, you now only have y, but it's still, you see in the workspace, it's, it's now gone. And so, uh, it's, in other words, it's dynamically refreshed, so it shows you exactly what's in the workspace at, at any given point. So if you're debugging code, and you, a lot of times debugging code, you're debugging it here, but you're doing stuff over here to help you figure out what you're doing wrong. And what you, what you also see down here are the actual values of the variables. Believe me, this can be extremely valuable when you're writing code and you've got some error and you have no idea of what's going on. You've got you, now you can also get you know you can also get help um, you know on, on functions for example you can you can get help and that that can show up down here. So you can have a combination you can you can see experimentation to figure out what you're doing wrong here. Here you have the code. Here you see the workspace. Now what are objects? And over here you can see a help file. So, in that sense, it's a pretty nice environment for developing uh, our code. I mentioned um, to the last class, and so I'll mention it to you also, um, 
that a lot of times you may write your whole project in R and you say, well, this part's really slow. So what you then say is, well, I'm going to take this slow code and I'm going to write it in C or C++ and I can then include what's called you know, external files that I can then link to through my R code and actually execute it in C code. And so it may become much faster. So you have what I call it foreign function interfaces. You can do C, C++. You can also do Java. So there are a lot of foreign function interfaces that you can actually use to speed up your code. You can also write it in a basic way. And then once you've done it, uh, we developed a package um, called Random Kate Nearest Neighbor. And so we originally did it. And we actually did it pretty efficiently, even using C code. But now we've added the capability of doing parallel computation. So if you're on a cluster or even a multi-core machine, you can actually run it on multiple cores and you can speed it up by perhaps many factors. Random K and N, if you have large data files, can be very time consuming. And so a lot of, a lot of people now are doing this. And there's a new package in R called Parallel, strangely enough that actually makes it fairly simple to, to parallelize your code, perhaps more simple than almost any other environment I know. And even if you have a laptop that has multiple cores, you can use the multiple cores to run parallel processing. So it turns out that you can actually do some fairly compute intensive things. You know, I mean, a lot of laptops now are pretty powerful. So. Well, last time I also showed you, um, so can someone tell me, if you looked at the book, if I have a variable name, what, what um, can I use to form the name? I mean, you can use alphabetic letters, right? What else can you use? Uh, each location can use numbers. You, well, you can use numbers anyway, unless it's the first. You can't start it with a number, but you don't need quotations if it's after the first. And underscore is the same. But you can't start with an underscore or a number. So if you wanted to do this for some pathological reason, you can put it in quotes. But I don't think I would recommend it in general. I mean, you could argue the reasons you might want to use the underscore. I mean, I suppose there are reasons you may want to start with a number and underscore. But so, so when I'm looking at this, then, um, you know, if I run it, okay, so I actually noticed that actually, when I did this, notice that I actually have variables by this name, by these two. Okay, let's, uh, now talking about attributes, so if I have, I'm going to, I deleted x, so I'm going to redefine it. Now notice that x is an integer of length 10. So this, this is telling you some information. Uh, these are single, single values, but x now is an integer of length 10. So it's a vector. And the type of the vector is an integer, and there are 10 values. And uh, suppose, I, suppose I now execute the next line. And so I've now defined x is an object, and I can assign a, I, a lot of times you have an object, and their attributes are predefined. In this case, uh, there's, there's no other, other than the vector, there's no other attributes um, uh, other than the data. But I can, suppose I define an attribute called foo for x, and I assign it a value 11. So I've done this, and now if I actually look at x, um, you can see that x has, besides the values, it now has an attribute foo, foo which has a value 11. Now, th again, this is kind of a silly example, but there are a lot of reasons why you want to, to create. Um, so for example, if I, if I say, um, I keep typing it wrong. If I say my plot gets histogram of x, well, there's the histogram, which of course is a uniform distribution because I did 1 to 10. And um, then, whoops, oh, I said my, 
I meant to say my plot. So these are the attributes. These are the attributes for the object my, which is actually a histogram. So those are predefined. I didn't define them. Those are just attributes. It tells you where you have a histogram, right? So you have breaks. It tells you what the breaks are. It tells you what the counts are within each category of the histogram. It tells you the sort of the density, the midpoints, and so forth. It's a and the class. We'll talk about this later, but the class of the histogram is a, it's a class histogram. So objects tend to have simple objects don't, but more complex objects always have attributes. But the point is, you can define dynamically your own attributes. And there are reasons why you if we think you might think of attributes as metadata. You see, that's what the NOIA really looks for is metadata. And if the metadata is suspicious, then it goes in and looks. So whether or not that worries you, because metadata can be pretty extensive, you see. Uh, at any rate, um, I say NRA. Yeah, I said NRA. Oh, that was a slip of time. Yeah, I meant NSA. <laughs> um, at any rate, um, so at any rate, um, So we create this, we have certain rules in terms of creating variable names. And they can be character digits, underscores, or dots. But don't start with an underscore or a number unless uh, you quote it. Okay? So we can create all these symbols, and symbols have, symbols have things attached to them. Typically, they have a value. Like if it's a vector, it will have the elements of the vector. But it can have these attributes attached to it as well as the value. So are there any questions on that? Now, if we have a function, so if I just say run this, then it says mean is a function. So what that means is that I could say I want the mean of x, which I have defined, right? And the mean is 5.5. So that's a function, but how did it See, x is an object, and you see, what it says is, I want the mean of some object. So in this case, x is a vector, and so it computes the mean of that vector. But suppose, uh, you know, if you, if you look at SAS, SAS has data tables, which is a rectangular matrix with columns, which can be of different types, and some are numeric, and jump has... Um, um, jump has also data tables that you can that you graphically see in a window and again you could compute the means at least of the numeric columns and so the corresponding object in R is called a data frame a data frame is sort of like a matrix except uh, in a matrix if you have say a 10 by 2 matrix you have 10 rows and 2 columns but in a matrix all the elements have to be of the same type so if they're numeric, they all must be numeric. But in a data frame, the columns can be in different types. So one, the first column could be numeric, second column could be a factor or a characters, you know, characters. And so, so a data frame sort of looks like a matrix, but each column, it's it's sort of column centric in that each column can be a different data type. So I could say I want the mean of a data frame, in which case it will compute the mean of the numeric columns. So what I'm trying to point out here is the mean is a generic function, and what it does depends upon the class of its first argument. So the first argument, there is only one argument here, it's x. And so the mean of x, it, it says, okay, this is a vector, I'm going to give you the mean of that vector. But if x is a data frame, then it gives you a data frame and a numeric columns and so forth. So mean is a generic function, and that basically means what the function does depends upon what the class is of the first argument. Does that make any sense? That will become, as we get into things further. Yeah. Just with overloading like that, can you do like you do in those object-oriented languages where you can overload by creating functions that are just different arguments? You have to specify it as a logical statement. Well, there are different classes in R, so uh, there are two main class systems. 
is the S3 classes, which is relatively simple. And basically, in S3 classes, this is a simple dispense function. It looks at the class of the first argument. A more sophisticated class are what are called S4 classes, and that's much more in line with what you're talking about in terms of a full-fledged object-oriented language. So uh, most people um, that are statisticians that are not super programmers write S3 classes because, and you will as part of this course write an S3 class. Um, you'll learn something about S4 classes, but I'm not sure I'm going to have you write code for an S4 class. But an S3 class is relatively simple. So, for example, um, one of the things we may do is there's a function called LM, which means linear models. So it can fit pretty sophisticated linear models. Well, I can show you how long, easy it is for you to write your own version of that function, which is not a simple function. Now, you're not going to have all the bells and whistles, but um, you can do it fairly simple using S3 classes. It becomes more complex with S4. Uh, but there's other class, since R is completely open, other people have written class environments for R. For example, there's a prototype system, which I kind of like. And um, there's a very popular graphic system called ggplot2, which is very, very powerful for doing graphics. It's based upon this prototype object system. So to say R is an object-based system is true, but there are actually a number of different ways you can do object-oriented programming is you can build your own class system. And presumably, if, you, if R doesn't do what you want to do, you could probably write the code to actually do it that way, in terms of overloading, for example. Um, <clears throat> so um, at any rate, the, um, the, there are two commonly used class systems, S3 and S4. And again, the prototype system is also pretty widely used. Um, so what distinguishes, uh, there are two main things. Uh, every object has a class. So when I said, you know, what is the class, what is the class of my, it's a class histogram. So of course the histogram is a class. And when I create a histogram, I create an instance of that class. So any, any, I created an instance of the histogram class called my. If I create another plot, it's another instance of the histogram plot. If I do another histogram, those are separate instances representing two different objects. And they would, and the attributes could be different. Certainly the values of the attributes would be different as well as, but I could add my own attributes. As well as, I, I might want the, I, want, I may want to add some attribute to a histogram that does something, that contains other metadata. Um, so, so um, when I'm thinking about classes with S3 classes, I have classes, but I also have generic functions. So the mean is a generic function. Print is a generic function. Uh, there are a lot of generic functions. And what that means is, is that the function is applied to the first argument. You look at the first argument and say, what is its class? It gets dispatched to the method for that class. And different classes can, different classes can have um, uh, different methods associated with it. So every class can have a different method associated, even though they all mean, they're means for different classes. And I'll show you the notation a little bit later, how that works. So in this case, this dispatch function, uh, it gets dispatched based on the argument, the first argument, which in our case was simply a vector. Now, there are some uh, special values, and one is null. And so if I, if I look at the length of null, and I run it, null has length 0. It is a special symbol. You cannot use it in your code. It has length 0. Now suppose I concatenate one to null, it's one, it kind of disappears. There's a reason why, you may say, well, why would you want to do this? But later on you may see. Suppose I need to give an initial value, which is null, to create the concept of a vector, but there's nothing in it. 
And then I'm going to have a programming loop. And every time I go through the loop, I want to add one value to the vector. So I sort out the null vector, and then I keep adding the results to it. So if you do a simulation study, and each time you run through the loop, you're doing one simulation, second simulation, third simulation. And every time you add the results to it. But I want to start out, I want to define the concept of, a, of something. Before I get into this loop, I need to define something to keep adding to. So I define that something is null, and then I can keep adding to it as I go through the loop. So, for ex so that becomes very, very common. Um, so this is not just sort of pathologic that I'm, I take null and I'm adding one to it, and I get one. The null doesn't show up. But I may, I may need that initial definition of, in order to start the whole process. And so if I say list, so list is a more complex data structure, and we'll talk about that more later. So there are, there are, there are a lot of da data structures. Of course, we've been talking about vectors, but there are more complicated, um, sort of next up from a vector, is a matrix or a, mul a multidimensional array. Uh, but those are all characterized by the, by the fact that all the elements must be the same. So if I have a matrix, I can't mix character and numeric in the same matrix. But if I have a data frame, that allows me more flexibility. If you want the ultimate flexibility, it's a list. So a list, in this case, in this case, the list contains two elements, A and null. And they actually show up. So that so and I'll talk about these double these double brackets I'll talk about later, but this is the first element of the list, and this is the value of the first element. So they're the double brackets versus a single. And um, so I actually have two elements in the list, A and null. But a list can be extremely flexible. So you can have list within list. So a list can have an element that's a list. And then that list can have an element that's a list. That's why it's called, a list is called a recursive structure. Because you can have list within list within list and so on forever. Okay. So how would you define, you know what, in, do you know what three factorial is? Oh, I'm not supposed to go here. <coughs> Unfortunately, I just went to sleep. I better set this so it doesn't go to sleep so easily. Someplace I have this. Let's see if I get this. So why am I getting a black screen? Why is it black? I've got to set this so it doesn't go to sleep because obviously uh, it's not good. I don't get it to clear. Let's see if this clears. Uh, that helps. Um, I mean, I just, there's a little flaw here. I see I can't let this iPad go to sleep because if it does, it blacks out. For some reason it's not waking up. Uh, at any rate, um, <clears throat> so if I have um, if I have three factorial, what is that? I'm not doing too good here. So. Right. So how do I define n factorial? N divided by n minus one. Divided by n minus two. Not divided. Yeah, so n is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times and so forth down to 1, right? How else can you write this? Yeah, so it's n times n minus 1 factorial. So I define the factorial in terms of itself. So you can program this recursively. You can be defined in terms of itself. So that's a, so that's a, you can think of that as a function defined in terms of itself. So uh, recursive programming is something that you may or may not want to do. There can be some inef inefficiencies associated with doing recursive programming, but that's, that's a recursive, um, you know, that the factorial is defined in terms of itself. Uh, so, for example, if you know the binomial distribution, the binomial... So what I want you to do for the next time, 
is tell me how the binomial distribution So that's first of all going to make you look up the definition of the density function. The binomial density function can be defined in terms of the stuff. Now, that's the next one. Okay. So, so at any rate, um, Lists are extremely important. When I write a function, if the output from that function is complex, like the function LM for doing linear models has complex output, they almost you almost always return the results of the function as a list. So you're doing a regression. What are you going to return? Well, you're going to return the regression coefficients. That's a vector of length however, however many vectors however many regression coefficients. But you might also want to return the residuals. Or you might want to return the R squared, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things could be returned as objects, but there are different. In other words, the vector of coefficients for the residuals is different in, in length than the vector of coefficients of the actual coefficients. And so you, you have to have a list type objects to return things of different types and lengths. So when we write, when you write functions, you often want to do that. What time is it today? Two. Almost two. Okay. So this is just a very brief mention of the word list. We're going to come back to that. Um, so I mentioned the language list, L-I-S-P. Do you know what it means? The LIS stands for list, and P for programming. It's list programming. So what a list, it turns out that operating on lists is extremely powerful. A lot of the parallel processing in R deals with mapping functions over lists. And so it turns out that a lot of, when you parallelize code, it turns out that one of the most important things you can do is operate on the different elements of the list simultaneously in different cores or different machines, whatever. And so uh, the concept of a list in R is fundamental, just like it's fundamental in the language Lisp. And so it's something that we'll spend some time on later on. <clears throat> so we have a type of NA. Does anyone know what NA means? Not available. Uh, we have data, right? You often have missing values. You got to deal with them. So, so the question is: Is what do you when you have missing values in a matrix or a data frame? What happens? Well, you can take some systems like Jump and R that if you have if if you have if you use certain columns of of your data table uh, like in um, and, and jump. And is anyone missing value in any row, it deletes the whole row. That's just the basic rule. And SAS does the same, same thing, except it's called a data set. So it deletes the row if a value is missing. Any value for any column that's used in that computation. You may not use all the columns in a computation, but if the columns you do use, any missing value deletes the whole row. Or is a little more flexible. In fact, uh, there are functions, there are default functions on what R does with missing values, but if you don't like what R does, then you can actually do whatever you want to do. So for an example, you know what the word imputation means? Amputation. Imputation. Or impute. If you have a missing value, you can often impute the value of that missing value using some model. So you actually, you actually replace missing values by some imputation function. So in R, that's quite simple to do. And there's some built-in imputation functions. And there are various packages that do imputation. But you can also write your own. So you actually typically, I mean, you may do something very simple. If you've got a column of numbers and you have missing values there, you may simply take the mean of all the numbers and replace the missing value by the mean. That's a very simple rule. Now, that has some consequences. 
because you're sort of generating data. Uh, but there are reasons why you may want to do that. So imputation is pretty common. You have missing values. But how do you represent missing values in R? You represent it with an NA. That represents missing data. How you deal with the missing value is a totally different question. But you can test. There's a function, is.na, which can test for a missing value. Do you have a missing value? And things of that sort. Missing value is, ty is a type logical. It means it's either missing or it's not. Right? Binary. It's missing or it's not missing. But there are different symbols for missing values depending on whether it's an integer missing value, a numeric missing value, etc. Is it a character missing value? So in R, it's not just that you know it's missing. You can actually test a type of missing value it is. So in that sense... You know, I could actually do an as character, which converts it to a character, or I could convert it to an integer type missing value. And then if I do type of, if I, if I coerce it as integer, coerces NA to be an integer missing value, and then if I say what is the type of it, it is now integer. But it's no longer just logical, which is default. So you can read a little bit more about that uh, in the text. Now, suppose I say, is this NA? Is NA, is dot NA is a function that tests whether or not something is missing. So I got NA in quotes. What is NA in quotes? Why not? It's a character string. It's not a missing value. It's a character string consisting of in A, but it's not. It doesn't mean that it's missing. It's simply a character string. So you create a character string by, you know, a, a string of letters with defining quotes. So. Okay. So uh, let's let's talk about infinity. And things like that. So 1 divided by 0, what is that? Well, let's look at y. It's an infinite. So there's a special symbol IML. What about minus y? Well, it's minus IMF, minus infinity. So you can represent both IMF and minus IMF, plus and minus infinity. R knows about those things. So you could actually test to see if something is plus or minus infinity. So if I take, if I take, if I take um, plus infinity minus, if I'm taking infinity minus infinity, what do you think NAM means? Not a number. What would it be? It's not defined. It's not a number. So R knows about all those types of things. So. so if I define Y to be plus infinity, um, it's still considered a type double. Double means double precision. It's stored as double precision within the computer memory. Essentially, all numeric calculations are done in R in, in double precision. It gives you much more accuracy than using single precision. Type of NA. NA is a built-in function. When you create functions, your functions will not be of type built-in. There are actually three types of functions, built-in, special, and closure. When you build it, it will be called a closure. Now, this is something, there are a couple of concepts that you're going to have to kind of work on. Um, one is the importance of and the significance of lists and how you represent them. And the other is what are called function closures. 
a closure, when you write a program and you have a function and you have x in it, how does how does x, suppose you define x in the function or you define it outside of the function, how does how do you know, how does the function know how to evaluate x? Because you may not have x defined inside of the function. So how does it how does it determine the value of x? Everything I do in R, I'm doing in what's called a global environment. But if you write a function, I create a space within that global environment that's specific to that function. So I could have things outside of the environment or inside. So there's a concept of environments. And that is the second thing you're going to really have to focus on because it's a little subtle. And the reason is, is because there are different scoping rules for determining how you evaluate objects within functions. And so, um, and it used to be there was a, well, I think it may still be, there was, there was something R derived from what's called the S language. And then from R, there was a commercial product called S Plus that was developed by, by well, it was actually S Plus was developed by the same people that developed S, which was AT&T Bell Labs. But then they sold off S Plus, and that's gone through a series of owners, and I think it's currently owned by TIBCO, T-I-B-C-O. And basically, uh, and then R came along as an open source alternative to, that's built on S. So both S plus and R are built on, are built upon the original S language. The problem is that S plus and R have different scoping rules. So that if you write a program for R, it may not run in S plus or vice versa. You have to be cognizant of the scoping rules, which is how you think of environments. So uh, again, that's something that will take you will take a look at. So, is and a is something that's immutable. It's not something you're going to change. Um, now, you can write your own functions that relate to what you do with missing values, but is and a is, is a predicate. It's determining whether or not something. It's saying, is it missing? So it's a conditional. It's saying, is it missing or not? Now, on the other hand, mean actually mean was written by the R folks, but it's still considered a built-in, it's, it's not considered a built-in function, it's considered a closure. Every function you write will be of closure. The mode of NA is logical, and we'll talk about modes a little bit more later. The storage mode, it's stored as characters. Now, you can get into the internals of how things are represented inside the computer, much, you know, but there are certain functions that you can do uh, to determine how things are represented and how much storage and so forth. Okay. So, there are also, if I look at y, y, remember, was plus infinity. Is it an integer? That's, is integer saying, is it an integer? No, it's not an integer. Is it a character? No, it's not a character. Is it a double? Yes, it is. Is it numeric? Yes, it is. So there are all these predicates that can test the type of object you have. Just got a few more to do, and timing it just about right. So what's it? 1 colon 3 simply gives one, two, three. The colon operator is a sequence operator. But what happens if I do colon 1.3 to 3.2? Well, we'll go from 1.3 to 2.3, but it won't go to 3.3 because 3.3 is bigger than 3.2. Do you follow what I'm saying? So it forms a sequence by default. It just it goes by one. Now, there are other functions that allow you more flat. You could go by two. There are not with this, but there are other functions that allow you to go by any stuff you want. And if I do 6 colon 3, it goes 6, 5, 4, 3. If I do x gets, if I go x gets um, 10 to 20, and then I type in x, I keep doing that. I guess it didn't matter. 
so this goes from 11 to 20 using the COLA operator. Now suppose I want a subset. You can use square brackets to get the subset. So in order, if I want the fourth and fifth elements, I can simply run that. And so I'm getting the fourth and the fifth, so I'm getting 14 and 15 from that vector. So I'm subsetting. So this is the, we'll be doing more on subsetting, but this is the first example of subsetting. So if I have a vector, I can subset, I can subset anything I want. Furthermore, you notice that I actually have a function. I have, R is a type, I mean, colon is a type of function. And it's a type of function that, that has the values on each side of it. It's, uh, it's a binary type function. And so I could put any expression in here that evaluates to a subset, and I could subset the string using a fairly sophisticated algorithm for determining. I may say I want, I want, I could say I want x greater than 14, x greater than 14, and it would subset. So if I say, for example, x greater than 14, and then I could say, I could say, um, x, so what did it do? So you see what I did here was I, I'm picking out all the elements of x that have a value greater than 14. So this could be, when I evaluate how I pick the elements, it could be a fairly sophisticated type of argument. Does that make sense, that last thing I did? Okay. Um, about 2.15, which is, any final questions? So we're just going to continue on in the section two and so forth. So you should be reading the book and trying it out yourself.